Homeric epics held a pivotal role in ancient Greek culture. They were taught to every Greek child and were valued for their literary excellence and the heroic exploits they conveyed. Beyond their individual merits, these epics helped to create a cultural link between the ancient Greeks and their distant ancestors. The influence of both the Iliad and the Odyssey extended beyond ancient Greece, captivating other cultures like the Etruscans and most notably the early Romans who shaped the foundational myth of their city around the Trojan hero Aeneas. In ancient Greece, there was a profound appeal for tales of heroic exploits and of the mythical, legendary battles of old. Interestingly enough though, the Greeks were the ones who introduced the concept of parody into the realm of storytelling. The word parodia in ancient Greek translates to a song performed alongside the original or more accurately, a counter song. In practice, a parody was a poem that mimicked the original work while infusing a much more playful, whimsical and humorous tone. Its intention was not to mock or ridicule the original work, but rather to elicit a light-hearted and comical effect to it. The sole surviving piece within the epic parody genre is the Battle of Frogs and Mice, a small epic that parodies Homer's Iliad. This work bears striking resemblances to the Iliad as it utilizes Homeric Greek and features elements such as epic dialogues, preparations for battles, divine assemblies and interventions, and intense depictions of combat, including graphic descriptions of violence. In fact, during much of ancient Greek history, at least until the Roman era, this work was attributed to Homer himself. It was believed that Homer intended to craft a more fanciful and light-hearted rendition of his grand epic. In later times though, Plutarch, the famous historian, attributed this work to a man named Pigris who lived in the region of Caria around the 5th century BC. Byzantine scholars also supported the idea that this man was the author of the epic. Despite that, modern scholars suggest that the epic was likely composed during the late Hellenistic period. It seems that the epic was quite famous in the ancient world, as many Greek and Roman scholars mentioned it in their works. During the Byzantine period, the Battle of Frogs and Mice served as a starting point for young students in order to later study the Iliad and the Odyssey. One day, a mouse, after escaping from a cat, stopped by a lake to quench its thirst. While it was drinking, a great frog appeared from the lake and said, Stranger, who are you? Where did you come from? And who is your father? Tell me all this truly and let me not find you lying, for if I find you worthy to be my friend, I will take you to my house and give you many noble gifts such as men give to their guests. I am the king Physignathos, the Puffjaw, and I am honoured in all the pond, being ruler of the frogs continually. The father that brought me up was Peleus, the one of the mud, who mated with Hydra Medusa, the water lady, by the banks of Eridanus. I see indeed that you are well looking and stouter than the ordinary, a scepted king and a warrior in fight. But come, make haste and tell me your descent. Then the mouse answered, why do you ask me my race, which is well known amongst all, both men and gods and the birds of heaven? Psiharpax, the cramp snatcher, I am called, and I am the son of Troxartes, the bread nibbler, my stout hearted father, and my mother is Lycomile, the quenlicker, the daughter of Ternophagus, the hamnoer, the king of the mice. She bare me in the mouse hall and nourished me with food, figs, and nuts, and dainties of all kinds. But how are you to make me your friend? We are altogether different in nature, for you get your living in the water, but I am used to eat such foods as men have. I never miss the thrice kneaded loaf in its neat round basket, or the thin wrapped cake full of sesame and cheese. In battle, I have never flinched from the cruel onset, but plunged straight into the fray and fought among the foremost. I fear not man, though he has a big body, but there are two things I fear above all else the whole world over, the hawk and the cat, for these bring great grief on me. 
I gnaw no radishes and cabbages and pumpkins, nor feed on green leeks and parsley, for these are food for you who live in the lake. Then Physignathos, the king of the frogs, answered, Stranger, you boast too much of belly matters. We too have many marvels to be seen, both in the lake and on the shore. For the son of Cronus has given us frogs the power to lead a double life, dwelling at will in two separate elements, and so we both leap on land and plunge beneath the water. It is easy for you to learn all of these things. Just mount up upon my back and hold me tight, lest you be lost, and so you shall come rejoicing to my house. Psiharpex agreed, climbed into the frog's back, and Physignathos began swimming swiftly across the lake. Suddenly, a great and fearsome water snake emerged from the lake, terrifying both animals. Physignathos, in a panic, released Psiharpex and plunged into the water to save himself. Psiharpex was left struggling in the water, and just before drowning, he shouted, O oh, Physignathos, you shall not go unpunished for this treachery. You threw me a castaway of your body as from a rock. Vile coward, on land you would not have been the better man, boxing or wrestling or running, but now you have tricked me and cast me in the water. Heaven has an avenging eye, and surely the host of mice will punish you and not let you escape. Another mouse, the Kopinix, the dish licker, happened to be on the banks of the lake and witnessed Siharpex's death. Distraught by what he saw, he hurried to gather the mice and informed them of the event. Siharpex's father, Troxartes, consumed by rage, urged the mice to ready themselves for war. Thus it was decided. The mice began arming themselves in preparation for battle. As the author narrates, First, they fastened on greaves and covered their shins with green bean pods broken into two parts which they had gnawed out, standing over them all night. Their breastplates were of skin stretched on reeds, skillfully made from a cat they had flayed. For shields, each had the centerpiece of a lamp, and their spears were long needles, all of bronze, the work of Ares, and the helmets upon their temples were peanut shells. The mice dispatched a herald named Ambassicatrice, the port visitor, to deliver the following message to the frogs. Frogs, the mice have sent me with their threats against you and bid you arm yourselves for war and battle, for they have seen the harpics in the water whom your king Physignathos slew. Fight then, as many of you as are warriors among the frogs. The frogs began accusing their king for the crime, however, he deceitfully replied, Friends, I killed no mouse, nor did I see one perishing. Surely he was drowned while playing by the lake and imitating the swimming of the frogs, and now these wretches blame me, but I am guiltless. Come then, let us take counsel how we may utterly destroy the wily mice. And so, the frogs started preparing for war. The author writes, they covered their shins with leaves of mallows and had breastplates made of fine green beet leaves and cabbage leaves skillfully fashioned for shields. Each one was equipped with a long pointed brush for a spear and smooth snail shells to cover their heads. Then they stood in close locked ranks upon the high bank, waving their spears. Zeus, the king of the gods, witnessed the events unfolding and called for a council on Olympus to determine whether they would support the mice or the frogs. The gods collectively decided not to intervene on either side, choosing instead to observe the conflict from afar. Zeus threw a great thunderbolt from the sky, and thus the battle commenced. Many brave warriors from both sides took part in this battle. Among them were Lichenor, the Licker, Ternoglyphus, the Hamnibbler, Ipsibuas, the Loud Crocker, and Kravgasides, the Hose Crocker. There was great bloodshed, and both sides suffered numerous casualties. The frog king, Physignathus, was wounded by Troxartes, Psiharpix's father. Physignathus, seeking escape, plunged into the lake and fled by swimming away from the battlefield.
In the heat of the battle, the great hero of the mice, Meridapex the Sly Snatcher, was summoned and he vowed to exterminate the frogs. Upon his arrival, the frogs scattered in fear, fleeing from his formidable presence. The rest of the mice rallied behind him and launched an unrelentless pursuit of the frogs. However, upon noticing this, the gods decided to intervene, realizing that if Meridapex were to continue unchecked, the frogs would undoubtedly be annihilated. Zeus hurled a thunderbolt from the sky to scatter the frogs and the mice. Despite the initial shock, the mice carried on the pursuit, and so Zeus had to take further action. He summoned from the depths of the lake the great warrior crabs equipped with dreadful weapons. The crabs assaulted the mice and gnawed at their feet, causing them to flee in terror. Thus ended the battle of frogs and mice.